<laughs> okay, um, hello everyone, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today for our panel on the growth of India as an arbitration destination. Uh, my name is uh, Vikramaditya Kanna, and I'm a professor of law at the University of Michigan Law School. And uh, my key areas of interest are uh, threefold, law and legal issues in India, including arbitration and judicial procedure, changes to the legal profession globally and in the U.S., and U.S. corporate law and white-collar crime. Uh, though not how to do it. I have to remind my students about that. Um, I'm, um, I'm the editor of uh, a couple of journals dealing with Indian law as well as white-collar crime. I run a research center uh, based both in the U.S. and in Delhi, addressing issues of corporate and financial law and policy, and uh, we also run an executive ed program in the U.S. for general counsels and directors of companies uh, that are doing business globally. So a uh, topic related to India's uh, dispute resolution system is very close to my heart. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today to moderate this panel and to introduce our distinguished panelists. Uh, to my immediate right is uh, Mr. Vidal Mascarenas, who is counsel in the International Arbitration Group of King and Spalding's New York office, where he represents individuals, corporations, NGOs, and states in international disputes. He is also an adjunct professor at Columbia Law School, although we will not hold that against him. <laughs> and he served as a um, law clerk to Her Excellency Rosalind Higgins at the International Court of Justice, better known as the World Court. And in 2014, the New York Law Journal ranked Vidal as one of the 42 rising star attorneys under the age of 40. They mean 30, don't they? Just kidding. Um, to his, Just the other <laughs> There we go. Uh, to his immediate right is Mr. Neeraj Kaul, who is currently Additional Solicitor General for India. He is one of the youngest senior advocates in India and a graduate of the famed St. Stephen's College and the University of Delhi, as well as having obtained his LLM from Wilson College at the University of Cambridge. That's the other Cambridge. Uh, he is an expert in the fields of arbitration, intellectual property rights, constitutional law, taxation, and corporate and commercial litigation. To his immediate right is Mr. Pramod Naya, who is head of chambers at Arista Chambers, a specialist dispute resolution firm based in India. He is admitted as an advocate in India and as a solicitor advocate with higher rights of audience in England and Wales. He regularly appears as counsel and advocate in a broad range of commercial, litigation, and public law matters before the Supreme Court of India and the Karnataka, Bombay, and New Delhi High Courts. He also acts as counsel and sits as arbitrator in domestic and international arbitrations and is a member of the London Court of International Arbitration. My goodness, you are a very busy man. <laughs> and finally, to his immediate right, Mr. Nakul Dhan, who is attendant at the leading English Barristers Chambers, 20 Essex Street, and is called to the bar in both India and Singapore. He practices before the Supreme Court of India, as well as the Court of Appeal and the High Court of the Republic of Singapore. He also has an active international arbitration practice, both as counsel, as well as an arbitrator, including assisting the Solicitor General of India in the $2 billion tax dispute against Vodafone. He's also led a number of arbitrations involving parties from India, Italy, Middle East, Malaysia, Singapore, United States, and many others. I'm delighted to be here to introduce this panel and also to begin discussion of a topic that has become extremely important as we think about justice uh, delivery services in India, as well as economic growth. I thought I'd begin the discussion today with a few general points about why the growth of India as an arbitration destination may be important before opening up the floor to our panelists. As we all know and have been discussing today, India is one of the fastest growing emerging markets, and both foreign and domestic investment are keen to be a part of the India story. However, one of the key issues that India is going to face is coming up with a reliable, consistent dispute resolution system. This is going to be important for both attracting and keeping foreign investment, but also for domestic investment and activity, and across all sectors. Whether it is a public-private partnership for infrastructure development, opening large retail stores, or enhancing cell phone services, dispute resolution is an important and critical part of the story. However, Indian courts have been plagued with well-known delays and decades-long disputes clogging the courts. Indeed, usually there was a joke that my grandfather used to tell me that in addition to whatever other things I might get upon his demise, he would also bequeath to me a number of land disputes, <laughs> um, which I thought was both sad and rather funny. 
Um, at the same time, of course, the delays in the system have led people to consider alternatives to judicial resolution for addressing disputes. And one that has been particularly prominent is arbitration. Uh, perhaps that's because both the speed associated with arbitration is so much better than with courts, but also because arbitrators are often selected for their area-specific expertise, whereas courts are usually populated with judges who are generalists. They may know the law very well, but they know it as a broad matter, not necessarily specific areas in as much depth as some arbitrators. In spite of the fact that arbitration is popular with respect to business in India, you often find parties avoiding India as a location for their arbitration. So they may select Indian law, they may hire Indian arbitrators, they may even hire Indian law experts. But they prefer to do the arbitration, it seems, in Singapore, in London, and in New York. It can't be for the cuisine. <laughs> so one wonders why that is and how that might be changing. The normal reason given for why India has been not the preferred choice for arbitration is that Indian courts have, until very recently, displayed some degree of hostility towards enforcing foreign arbitral awards, leading many parties to prefer being overseas. <clears throat> in addition to which, there's been some discussion about whether or not there's sufficient skills uh, within the Indian arbitration bar to sustain a large practice. But it seems that things are beginning to change. Over the last few years, we've noticed the Indian Supreme Court becoming more friendly towards foreign arbitration and arbitration more generally leading us to perhaps think maybe this is the time for arbitration in India to really take off. And what we hope to do in this panel in the course of our discussion is discuss why that might be important, both for lawyers and those involved in arbitration, but also for economic growth in India, and why it might be specifically important that India take an important role in this and not simply outsource their dispute resolution to Singapore or London or some other place where people perceive enforcement to be easier. To begin our discussion, I'm going to tap uh, my colleague to my right here, Mr. Kaul, to tell us a little bit about what the general state of arbitration is in India and how things have progressed until now. So without further ado, I'll hand over the floor. Uh, the 1940 Act, as it existed in India, was completely outdated, which led to the 1996 Act coming in, which was till date, I think, a very progressive and modern legislation, a legislation which was possibly flawless without with some odd things which need to be ironed out. And the importance with the legislature and parliament gave to economic reforms is evident from the statements of objects and reasons as they were stated in the legislation, which seldom happens. And one of the, state, the stated objects was that India's economic reforms would not be complete without adapting and adopting the new model law, which was the Unsatral model, which got incorporated in the 1996 Act. So things were perfect. The Supreme Court gave that needed push to Parliament when the 1996 Act came with a few judgments. And then the problem started, where the Supreme Court came out with a mixed bag of decisions. So let me just set out a few decisions which really set the 1996 Act back by many years, and then the mitigating judgments which followed thereafter, where the Supreme Court sought to correct itself. In the beginning came a few judgments which opened up doors for court interference in merits of the award which were given. Now, one of the principal things in an arbitration is that if you have an arbitral award, as far as possible, the court interference should be minimal. As far as the pre-arbitration process is concerned, the court interference should be minimal. And what we saw with judgments of the Supreme Court were that both with pre-arbitration processes, the court started interfering, as also with the awards which came on the merits of the award, the court started interfering, and then came to say some judgments which, were, which really set the clock back. For instance, a judgment came saying that wherever fraud is alleged, or where complicated facts are involved involving fraud, arbitration may not be the appropriate remedy. Now, luckily, all these events or developments were mitigated by the Supreme Court by subsequent judgments on going back and again narrowing down the scope of interference with arbitration awards, giving a certain importance to finality, which should be there, reversing decisions that if fraud or any other complicated fact is involved, that's no ground to eliminate an arbitration process, 
And more importantly, recently, the Law Commission of India has also made recommending, uh, recommendations which are far-reaching in nature and would possibly correct some of the errors which were committed by the courts. Some have been rectified, some need to be rectified, and I think if the Law Commission recommendations are accepted ultimately <coughs> by the government and parliament, it would go a long way in correcting that process. Other than that, I think India today needs a more specialized arbitration bar. India needs more institutionalized arbitrations, not, not ad hoc arbitrations the way they are happening. And in days to come, I think with the development of more institutionalized arbitration, a more professional arbitration bar, lesser adjournments, lower costs, I think India should be a favorable destination in days to come. That's very helpful. I mean, you mentioned that the degree of court interference after the 1996 Act is perhaps greater than anticipated by the 1996 Act, just as to provide maybe a word of background. Uh, the reason that is important is one of the goals of arbitration is to speed up decision making. If the court is interfering with the decisions as they're coming down or in their enforcement, it more or less undermines the entire value of arbitration. And this is significant in India because one of the key concerns with the Indian courts was the decades or too long wait to get things decided. If the courts get involved in arbitration, it basically resurrects that problem. Um, but my understanding is that in the last couple of years, the Supreme Court seems to have changed tack and become more willing to be arbitration friendly. What do you think that's, is... That's exactly <coughs> what I said, that they created the problem and, and they're, solved. <laughs> they're solving the problem. <laughs> so the, the, the act as it came was very clear. The scope of interference, the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal as far as possible, the scope, the depth, the width, everything of interference will be left to the arbitral tribunal. Then came in judgments with some unguarded language which opened up doors for courts to interfere. And then realizing that that was leading to both undue interference with awards as also at the pre-arbitration stage because we saw a whole phase where even before an arbitral process could start, suits came to be filed anti-suit injunctions were sought, anti-arbitration injunctions were sought, wherefore months and years in injunction would continue before an arbitral process could start. Now that all got rectified over a period of time. Increasingly the judgments have been on the line that the Act completely prohibits any suit at all for granting of an anti-arbitration or an anti-suit injunction. As far as possible, do not interfere with the merits of the case until unless there's patent illegality. Even public policy, which was one of the grounds for interfering with uh, arbitration processes, is sought to be narrowed down. And those are the lines on which the Law Commission recommendations are now coming. That is indeed very impressive. And I'd be curious to know the other panelists' view, since you're often dealing with parties who now have to deal with the change to, or the changing reality of Indian arbitration. Do you see parties expressing a greater interest in doing arbitrations in India, or are they still somewhat cautious about about approaching India in that sense? Uh, I think they're still very cautious about approaching India, and there's a reason for it. And let's actually understand the reality of why things went wrong. I mean, I have gone to a number of seminars. There's been a lot of India bashing that's happened. I have tried to bat for India many times. I've also tried to bash India many times, uh, <laughs> depending on what I want to uh, say and depending on what the position is. But there's a, l let's see what happened. We got a brilliant act in 1996. A country like Singapore actually adopted the same statute in 2001. Why has Singapore become such a big arbitration center and India hasn't? <coughs> it's because we didn't train our judges. Uh, India is not just about Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore. You've got investments all over India. So if somebody had an arbitration which related to an investment somewhere in some godforsaken part of central India, and he went to a district court in relation to that matter, the district court judge who dealt with land law for 25 years of his life was suddenly asked to rule on international arbitration in the New York Convention. He'd never even heard of these things. So that's really where you know our slippery slope started. What's happened over the course of the last couple of years is that judges have become commercially sad. And it's these judges who have now brought the arbitration law back into space. The problem is, we don't have a consistent arbitration bench uh, of arbitration specialist judges all over the country. And so to answer your question, are people still happy about uh, uh, taking their arbitrations out? The answer is yes, because they're always skeptical that they would end up before a court where you wouldn't find a specialist judge, and then the matter gets stuck. 
But if you go to the Delhi High Court today and you look at the present roster, it's got a brilliant judge who looks at international arbitration. You go to the Supreme Court, I mean, I have just, in fact, I was talking to uh, Pramod right now. I mean, I have managed to get an arbitrator appointed in a case of uh, a non signatory based on US law, based on a very, uh, based on Singapore law, because uh, there are certain instances where you can actually get an arbitrator appointed in a non in when you've got a non signatory. Uh, because the judge understood where I was taking the case, and he and he's done it in, in, in two months. But if you ended up going to a court uh, where the judge didn't understand the proposition, that matter would linger on for two years. I mean, I think to you know, answer your question, I'm a New York qualified lawyer. I said I work in New York for a law firm. I do disputes work, uh, and our transactional lawyers call us up all the time. You know, they close a big deal. They're very excited. Um, the prospect of a long-term agreement between two commercial parties, and they say, oh, we have this, we call it a midnight clause because it's the last thing they think about, which is, oh, in case of a dispute which may arise, what should we put? You know, we've chosen arbitration, it's boilerplate. Um, you know, what do you consider? And if, even if there, if there are two parties and one is international, the other is Indian, if they seek that arbitration in India, that's the one thing I would say, before you open the champagne, strike that clause. And you know, we constantly see these updates. Okay, Supreme Court has you know, revisited some of the, the negative precedents. There's a change. We're also aware that it's common law. It can be built over time. It can also be taken away with you know, another, another bad judgment. And so despite the recent trend uh, that we're seeing in the last couple of years, as a disputes lawyer advising on where to seek the arbitration, and if you're not representing the Indian party, you would still not choose India as the best. And that sort of underscores, I think, one of the constraints or one of the limits that India's facing as it tries to grow itself as an arbitration destination. I mean, one of the things I put to you for a moment also is your sense as to which kinds of companies or industries are inclined to target putting in arbitration as an important method for addressing any disputes that come up. Is it every industry? Are there some that are more likely to do it? Well, well, I think uh, industries across the board are probably trying arbitration today. And, uh, but I think it's probably true of the, the technology industry, it's true of the construction and infrastructure industry, it's true of aviation, it's true of uh, JV disputes. Now, all these agreements have arbitration clauses. In fact, arbitration has become so popular that now the vast majority of commercial contracts that are drafted contain arbitration clauses. And this has been empirically verified by uh, a 2013 study carried out by PwC. And one of the most startling, and even to an arbitration practitioner, it was quite a startling statistic, because uh, the study found that around 83% of contracts contain arbitration clauses. And that is a staggering statistic, because at least in India, and at least when it comes to commercial contracts, arbitration is no longer an alternate mode of dispute resolution is probably the mainstream mode of dispute, uh, dispute resolution. So I think the use of arbitration has probably straddled all industries. I think there's probably been one industry which has traditionally been reluctant, and I think this is probably a global phenomenon, where the banking and finance industry has uh, been uh, rather reluctant to embrace arbitration. And that's probably because they uh, have self-help remedies. For example, in the Indian context, they can often enforce their securities without recourse to court assistance. Uh, but when court assistance is required, they probably would prefer uh, going to the courts rather than going to arbitration because uh, although the amounts in many of these disputes may be huge, uh, these are not factually complex disputes which require uh, fact determination at a, at a complex trial. Uh, the amounts involved may be huge, but it can be something which is decided very quickly and therefore lends itself very easily to be decided through a summary procedure, which is much quicker. And unfortunately, arbitration is probably not flexible enough to allow a summary procedure, uh, or at least not yet, that, that might come. And for those reasons, I think the banking and finance industry has traditionally been a little reluctant to embrace arbitration, uh, but most other uh, sectors of the Indian economy has used arbitration. Just a couple of observations uh, in respect of the previous question. Now, in terms of the popularity of arbitration in India, uh, well, in many ways, it's probably a feeling that this is better than the other alternatives. It's not because people are confident about the prospects of having a, a commercially viable dispute resolution mechanism in arbitration. It's probably it's it's the the the, uh, the most efficient of all the alternatives that you have, uh, but comes with its challenges. And uh, well, um, Neil spoke about having. Uh, about the need to have a good arbitration bar. I think that's absolutely true. If, if you look at uh, arbitration as a game, 
then what you need for the game to succeed is, you know, just having a fantastic stadium is not good enough. What you need are, are good players, you need, uh, you know, referees who enforce the rules of the game, so therefore you need good arbitrators, you need good judges who enforce the rules of the game, and you also need a well-informed audience who are the users of, uh, of arbitration, and, you know, some of the choices they make can really influence how the arbitration is carried on. So, for example, whether they use ad hoc arbitration, or whether they use institutional arbitration, now these are all going to be drivers as to uh, whether arbitration can be more efficient in the Indian context. Perhaps you could elaborate a little on the difference between ad hoc and institutional arbitration. Well, I think uh, uh, in the Indian context, uh, I, I, mean, I don't have any statistics, but I would be surprised if anything less than 99% of arbitrations are ad hoc. Uh, and that's really fueled by uh, a sense that uh, people have that institutional arbitration is more expensive because one additional layer of cost that parties have to bear in an institutional arbitration is the cost of the arbitral institution itself, which is involved in administering the dispute. But that's usually false economy. Uh, for a number of reasons. One, uh, I think globally, uh, the, the awards of institutional uh, arbitrations, or the, the awards that uh, have been the subject matter of institutional arbitrations, have a much better rate of enforcement. Uh, so for example, in India, it's almost rare to have uh, an award uh, made by made under the ICC rules or the LCIA rules or the CIA rules set aside simply because these institutions uh, really do pride their reputation and they would ensure that any award that bears their name is a award that is enforceable and uh, these institutions have a have a, have you know do this through a number of ways they ensure that the best people are appointed as arbitrators. They also ensure that they review the arbitration award. Uh, some processes of review are quite intrusive. For example, the ICC uh, would be very intrusive in the way they review awards, uh, whereas uh, institutions like SEAC and the LCIA would, be, would adopt probably a more light touch approach. But this kind of review, the, the appointment of quality arbitrators, the, the fact that there exists a very clear structure and a regimen of carrying out arbitrations ensures that the end quality of the work product is good and therefore it's unlikely to be tampered by the courts. And if courts have that kind of reassurance that there's, an, there's a quality institution that is supervising the arbitration, then they're going to be quite reluctant to set aside arbitration awards. And this is, this is probably the reason why in India you've traditionally had an anti-arbitration uh, trend. The reason is judges don't trust the arbitrators. And that's simply because the arbitrators are usually not trained. Uh, in some cases, uh, their integrity is not beyond doubt. And because of all this, the judges, it's, it's always a classic conflict between the high principle and the low principle. The high principle is that justice must be done. The low principle is that disputes must be resolved quickly. And therefore, if it becomes a conflict between the high principle and the low principle, the judges would prefer to adopt the high principle and ensure that even if they do a full-fledged review, they would like to be absolutely sure that the, just, that the decision that is made is the right one. And for, it's probably for that reason. And I, you know, I, I think a lot of uncharitable comments are made about the Indian courts, about the extent of intervention that is made. But it's really fueled by this. Uh, judges really don't want to give their stamp of approval to a, a judgment which they believe is not just. And, but of course, they may have different notions of what justice is in a particular case, but it's really fueled by this. Well, now that there's a greater degree or a movement towards institutionalization of arbitration, the fact that the arbitration positions themselves are qualitatively better than what they were 10 years back, I think we're probably quite firmly now in a pro-arbitration uh, jurisprudence in India. That's a, that's a very promising development. It's interesting. Most most of what we've been talking about here are private parties negotiating for arbitration clauses in their arrangements. But I imagine that one of the big areas that's growing, and Kevin, I think you probably can speak to this uh, better than us anyone, is the growth in what might be called uh, bits-related international arbitration, which is often usually um, a party in one country that's made an investment, for example, in India, suing the Indian government, claiming that they have violated the investment treaty under which the investment was made. Perhaps sure, I'm happy to speak about this. And just out of curiosity, how many people in the audience are familiar with this idea of bilateral investment treaties and arbitrations under those instruments? Okay, so, so some. Um, I'm happy to speak about it in particular because 
I'm basically going to be talking about suing governments under these international law instruments, and it's great to be sitting right next to the additional Solicitor General of India. Uh, <laughs> uh, talking about arbitration as a target, you know, here. Um, I'm also happy because my younger brother's in the audience, and I feel like this like legitimizes me now, and I've achieved and arrived in my in my career. Um, so I. Um, Touche. So um, you know. We, we're trying to keep our remarks short because we want to be animated, and I was thinking, how do I sum up the history of bilateral investment treaties? And I thought I was just going to break this down into three phases, which I hope are not arbitrarily chosen. Uh, one, as one must, you must start with the history of the United Nations, right? I mean, if you have a limited period of time, then you just go back to the United Nations Charter, and it's the mid-1940s. And basically, you have these debates playing out in the General Assembly, and the question there is, to what extent is this new international economic world order under the United Nations going to be democratic? And you have these debates in the 1950s and in the 1960s over sovereignty over natural resources, and largely it's a debate between developing states and developed states. So you have resolutions passed, you know, the resolution on permanent sovereignty over natural resources. In the 1970s, you have the Charter on the Economic Rights and Duties of States. Um, and you have attempts at creating a multilateral instrument to facilitate and regulate the flow of cross-border investment, especially in capital-intensive projects. So, you know, in development projects, and in infrastructure, and in energy, and mining, and natural resources. Not, you know, the soft law resolutions pass, but this multilateral convention, which would be binding law on the states that, that ratify the convention, does not come to pass, because states can't agree on, you know, striking the balance between the rights of investors as they seek international law protections when they make investments in, in developing states, and then protecting the rights of states to regulate you know, these foreign investments that are long-term that are going to be carried out in their <coughs> territories. So while these debates are underway, there's a new sort of bilateral instrument that's created called bilateral investment treaties. And the idea is, you know, if two states enter into a bilateral investment treaty, then nationals of one state, the investor state, can make an investment in the territory of another state, the party that signed that BIT, <coughs> and subject to the terms of that instrument, his or her, its long-term investment will be protected for some basic international law protections. So the typical ones you hear about are expropriation. So a government can expropriate your asset, but subject to certain requirements. It has to be with a public purpose, you know, in a non-discriminatory manner, with due process, with fair, adequate, and effective compensation. You're you know, generally protected from unfair and inequitable treatment. So the government gave you legitimate expectations that you can base your investment on. Stabilization clauses that said, we won't change, for example, the tax structure once you make your investment for the duration of your investment, or certain protections like this, the BIT will compensate you. And one of the big innovations of bilateral investment treaties, and it was actually quite revolutionary for international law, was it gave the investor the right to sue the government directly if the government did something that impacted the investment in a way prohibited by the bilateral investment treaty. The reason this was revolutionary in international law is normally the traditional understanding is international law regulates a relationship between states. And back in the day, you know, if you had a, a claim against your government for expropriation, a government, not yours, a foreign government, you would ask your government, please espouse my claim and, you know, battle it out. But here you have the right to arbitrate these disputes. So that's the first period is this creation against the backdrop of the United Nations raging debates over natural resources. Pakistan and uh, Germany entered into the first BIT in the late 1950s. And in the next 50 years, you have over 3,000 such BITs entered into. You also have free trade agreements that contain investment chapters that contain similar protections to what's found in these bilateral investment treaties. So 1991 is the, is the next period I'm going to focus on, and here it's India and turning to liberalization, and in the mid-1990s, India starts entering into BITs. It wants to encourage foreign investment. It sees that this is what developing states are doing to attract foreign investment, and so it's getting in on the game to become competitive with those other targets of outward-bound investment, and India in the next 15 years, I think, ratifies about 80-plus BIT instruments. Now, Although these were there in the backdrop, they weren't, in the first sort of decade of this century, they weren't, they weren't used, or if they were used, you didn't know about them because India has not ratified a multilateral convention called the International Convention for the Settlement of Investment Disputes. Um, which, you know, normally this is a body chosen by states and this will sort of guide as an institution arbitrations, uh, you know, entered into under these various BITs. So India's um, 
BITs contain an unsubtral arbitration clause, which is sort of this ad hoc arbitration that's not institution administered, although the parties can choose that. One of the advantages of unsubtral arbitration, or disadvantages if you represent civil society or the public, is these are much more confidential. With ICSID, there's a certain publicity requirement that goes with this. So in the 1990s, India enters into these BITs. In the first decade, we're sort of, okay, business as usual. Let's see what happens. Let's see about this whole liberalization deal, good economic growth, all this stuff is happening. And then in 2011, this is the third decade, a uh, third period for me, you have the White Industries Award come out and become public. And this is a very controversial case because it turns on an investor who won in a commercial arbitration and then sought to enforce the award in an Indian court. And I don't want to go into the procedural issues that were at stake there, but basically the investors said, I'm getting nowhere. Uh, and there were you know, proceedings to set aside the award, there were proceedings to enforce the award. So the investor said, I'm going to take up my rights under this bilateral investment treaty to bring a claim that I'm being denied effective means of enforcing my rights. And in addition to, you know, what was also interesting was treaties can tra contain a most favored nation clause, which normally say that the investor will be treated the same way as nationals, and also third party nationals of other states into which India, in this case, has entered into BITs. And so this, I believe it was an Australian um, um, inv investor said, I'm going to use the MFN clause to make use of a provision in another BIT entered into, I think, between Kuwait and, and India to say that by you know, basically <coughs> delaying my enforcement proceedings in Indian courts, I've been effectively denied my rights uh, using language not found in the Australia-India BIT. And the investor prevailed. And this was really controversial because as everyone's been talking about, there's just generally an acknowledged backlog in, in Indian cases. And so suddenly the, the perception was investors are using this sort of as a way to get out of what everybody's expecting. The ordinary litigant is, you know, expecting decades of litigation over complex disputes. When that happened, followed by a succession of very high profile BITs filed against, uh, arbitrations filed against the government, you know, the Vodafone case relating to retroactive taxation, you know, cases instituted uh, regarding the 2G, 3G spectrum um, scandal, you know, cases about corruption, about cancellation of contracts because of force majeure, um, which basically means that the government, you know, economic hardship or certain other conditions, in this case, uh, national security, excused its performance under agreements. All of these cases were filed such that in 2012, I believe, or maybe 13, the United Nations um, Trade and Development Organization noted that India was now becoming uh, one of the top five respondent states in these BIT arbitrations, putting it on par with states like Bolivia, Ecuador, Venezuela, where sort of resource nationalism that had happened in the first decade of this century under President Chavez, Morales, um, Korea, and, and Ecuador, you know, suddenly India was being lumped into that category and it brought into question, you know, what is the future of India BIT arbitration? Um, so that is something that we're seeing now. There's a lot that's uh, in, in a play, but having marched you from 19, the mid-1940s to at least 2013, I'm going to take a break because uh, okay. maybe you have a question. Uh, <laughs> I have many, but I'll save them. I, I should mention that uh, you, you mentioned White Industries. We actually have Mr. Lutfred's firm was the one that actually uh, argued that seminal matter. So uh, we have a, an expert in our audience as well. Um, and now I'm nervous about what I said. <laughs> We'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> My understanding, though, is that uh, with respect to bits arrangements, India is in the process of negotiating uh, a bit with the United States. And my understanding is that the enforcement of the bits <coughs> is actually one of the big sort of things that's delaying the agreement. I'd be curious whether you or other members of the panel had any comments about that as being potentially an important development in the uh, both in arbitration but also in the ability of, for example, U.S. investors to be feeling more free to invest on the Indian side. Sure. I mean, you know, the, in this generation of bilateral investment treaty, investment treaty arbitration, all states are sort of sitting up and taking notice of what's happened in the last decade. Because even though the exit convention was, you know, ratified by a bunch of states, not India, but you know, there are a lot of signatories. This took place in the 1950s. You have all these bilateral investment treaties that are being promulgated. It's really been in the 21st century that you've now seen panic on the part of, of states as to these high-profile arbitrations and the, the number of arbitrations that are being filed. You know, in the last year, for example, in, well, in the last seven months, you might have heard about the Yukos case against the Russian Federation, uh, where an investment tribunal awarded Yukos, which is an oil company that operated in Russia, $50 billion 
Um, with a B, fifty billion dollars. I mean, before that, the major award was Occidental against Ecuador for one point two billion. You had Exxon Mobil against Venezuela for one point six billion. Um, now you have cases that are pending that are in the range of tens of billions, and then you have the Yukos case with fifty billion dollars under the Energy Charter Treaty. So all states, including India, are taking notice. You know, India entered into a, a BIT with the UAE last year, and there are, I haven't actually been able to find a copy of the text of the agreement, but there have been modifications. One is a restriction in the, in, in the dispute resolution clause. You know, can these, um, in particular, there's a carve out of stuff done by the Indian courts does not fall within the scope of the BIT. So this was sort of a response to wide industries of, you know, we didn't expect that you'd be sort of using this, you know, delay by courts or the court judicial process playing itself out regularly or maybe not regularly as an issue to be, you know, arbitrated under this BIT. So there's been that part about you're seeing a question of IP rights. That's a huge deal, especially for India right now with the pharmaceutical sector, right? IP rights are protected as a form of investment under most BITs. Um, and there are questions of, you know, generic drugs and whether that infringes on uh, patent laws, especially you know under the TRIPS agreement of the WTO. That's another area that's being debated. There is also this question of remaining, retaining judicial review um, of arbitration <coughs> awards if the parties agree under these BITs to submit their disputes to arbitration. I do have to say one thing. Even though there is the unsatural arbitration possibility provided for in in BITs, that <coughs> does not erase judicial review. Under the unsatural rules, if there's an arbitration award that comes out, you can go to the seat of the jurisdiction that render the award to seek it set aside, right? And this was some of the, what was being described on theoretically limited grounds of, of set aside or vacator of an arbitral award. I will tell you as someone who, you know, advises investors who are suing governments, uh, if I were advising a client to <coughs> sue the government of India, I would say, try as you can to not seek your arbitration in India, but to seat it in a, in a third, uh, third party jurisdiction, in, in England or in The Hague, in the Netherlands, because then if there is um, controversy about setting aside the award, that should take place in the seat where the arbitration was seated. So in the, in, in, the, in the Netherlands or in England, which will apply the New York Convention, which is a multilateral instrument, but strictly as one would expect with uh, limited grounds for setting aside there. So, so the other panelists, please come forward. Thanks, Rick. Just a couple of observations on that. But I think after the decision in the white industries was rendered, there were a few voices from the fringes which basically said that India must terminate uh, the entire um, set of BITs that it entered into uh, in the 1990s and in the first decade of the century. Uh, but the government of the day, I think, uh, decided that that was probably not going to be the wisest move. It was probably going to be something that sends the wrong message to, to the uh, potential investors and to the foreign investors in India. But instead, what the government has decided to do is it has decided to reshape its model BIT. And that process is still uh, ongoing. So the India-US BIT negotiation is actually put on hold at the moment, whilst this model BIT is being refashioned, as it were. And some of the important provisions of this model BIT that are under active consideration <coughs> is that uh, there's a clear fork in the road provision, which is you can either go to international arbitration to enforce your rights, or you can go to the domestic courts. And the choice that you make is an irrevocable choice. You choose one choice, I mean, you, you choose one route and you've got to stick to it. You can't then you know, use the Indian courts as your first port of call for resolving the dispute. And then when you're ultimately unhappy with the result, then they can't really be a recourse to international arbitration. And these are some of the changes that are being contemplated. Well, on, on white industries itself, I mean, the reason it's controversial is because, it, like, like Viren said, it was not entirely unexpected. Uh, I, mean, I don't think any investor which had done its due diligence would have expected to get rapid relief before the Indian courts, because bear in mind the fact that the Indian courts are probably burdened with 30 million cases, and that's a huge number. And it's, I think it's probably a little unfair to the Indian courts to expect them to prioritize cases involving foreign investors and have that resolved on a fast track basis, whereas there are other people who, who probably have to go to the back of the queue and await their turn. And the most important thing about this is, you know, I think there's probably a big gaping black hole in the decision in white industries, which probably has not been understood by many. The reason is the uh, white industries case was based on a precedent in uh, the in a, in a different case, uh, you know, rising out of uh, Latin America. And the treaty language in that was that the state would basically provide effective means 
to provide, I mean, uh, effective means of enforcing, of asserting rights and enforcing claims. And that was the language used in that uh, BIT. So the Chevron versus Lequida case, which was a precedent that was relied upon by the tribunal of white industries, was quite different from the language used in the India uh, Australia BIT, or actually the India Kuwait BIT, from which this language was actually adopted. The India Kuwait BIT basically said that uh, the uh, every host state uh, has the responsibility of providing investors the opportunity of, of providing investors an effective means of asserting rights and enforcing claims in accordance with national law. And it is this portion, in accordance with national law, which was completely missed by the tribunal when it held that there's a universal standard of enforcing arbitration awards. And what does that universal standard mean? Well, in Switzerland, they enforce arbitration awards in less than three months. Uh, there's absolutely no way that an Indian court can decide an enforcement application in three months simply because of the kind of caseload that it has. And therefore, to talk about a universal standard of enforcing arbitration awards is simply not practical. It's not what the treaty provided, the New York Convention doesn't provide it, and where does the, where does the, where does the tribunal basically get this universal standard from? And I think that's the big gaping hole in the reasoning of the white industry's judgment. And the fact is, the investor was not in a sense prejudiced. Yes, of course, it waited for probably eight years. Uh, whilst, and that was probably because of a peculiarity of Indian law, the issue was whether Indian courts could basically set aside a foreign arbitration award or not. And that issue wound its way uh, up to the Indian Supreme Court, where the Indian Supreme Court ultimately decided in the Balco case that it could not. But that, that process took time, but it was not as though the investor was, uh, in a sense, prejudiced, because uh, when you have an arbitration award, you get the, you know, when, the, when a court decides to enforce an arbitration award, you get the full money that is uh, awarded by the tribunal. You have interest, which is the best compensation that an investor can get. It's not a case where the company is going bankrupt. Yes, it might take you some time, but you were prepared for those delays when you decided to invest in India. You would be awarded interest, and that would probably make you whole. And ultimately, I mean, this is something that people don't realize. The Indian courts have actually a very good track record of enforcing foreign arbitration awards. There was a study carried out around four years back of the enforcement record of the Indian courts. And the study found that out of 50 cases which were studied, the Indian courts actually enforced the foreign arbitration award in 49 of those. So the award would ultimately have been enforced. The investor would have probably got uh, the full rate of interest awarded by the arbitral tribunal. And that would have provided a, an effective remedy. What you didn't need is for an international arbitral tribunal to leapfrog the process. The case was still pending before the Indian courts. The Indian courts had not refused enforcement. And whilst the matter was still pending before the Indian courts, the arbitral tribunal in white industries decided the way it did. And it's these kind of policy choices that are made by arbitrators that make investment arbitration so controversial. I mean, how does the international arbitral tribunal decide that uh, six months must be the time frame for a uh, domestic court anywhere in the world to enforce an arbitration award. You don't have those standards in any international treaty in the world. And therefore, to talk about a universal standard of enforcing arbitration awards is probably, in, 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 in many ways, uh, you know, a step too far. And that's the reason why white industries are so controversial. So uh, I know that one can talk about this for quite some time. So I want to just slightly change gears to talk a little bit about what India can do now. I mean, from our discussion thus far, it seems like private parties are increasingly using arbitration when they're dealing with business in India. Individuals, when they're dealing with things that involve investment in India, are signing or being subject to bits arrangements. And we're seeing that the courts are becoming more receptive to enforcing arbitration agreements. So what at this point does India need to do, given that all the stars seem to be well aligned, to grow its domestic arbitration scene? Michael, maybe you want to take the first crack at this. No, uh, thanks. I mean, what, what does a party look for when he's looking to arbitrate in a particular destination? You look for neutrality, you're looking for competence, and most importantly, you're looking for finality. Now, as far as neutrality is concerned, I don't think there's ever been any criticism against arbitrators in India or judges in India about them not being neutral. As far as competence is concerned, I don't think you can criticize or you can find fault with Indian lawyers who are not competent enough. They are, they are very competent. The problem that you have with Indian lawyers is not of competence, but of time. And I think this has already been fleshed out. If you can get an arbitration bar and you can get lawyers who can be dedicated to doing arbitration, that's something that that's a problem we will then solve naturally. Finally, it comes out of finality. And this is where you've got to try and understand India and try and see how you can actually render and ensure that arbitration awards are final 
they're binding, and they're eventually enforceable. Now, when, when you look at this, you've got to then go down to the, ju to the judiciary. The judiciary has to be supported. And the only way you can find a supportive judiciary is if you have specialist arbitration trained judges who know and who recognize that today you have to uphold the primacy to arbitrate. If two parties have chosen to go to an arbitrator, even if the arbitrator has got it wrong, the judges need not interfere. It's what Pramod mentioned. The question is, does justice have to be done, or are you looking at speed? The point is, how do you look at justice being done? Is justice being done because you as a court can second guess what an arbitrator has done? The answer is no. You as a court are not supposed to second guess what an arbitrator has done because two parties chose to go to a particular individual or a particular tribunal, and they made him the decider of their facts. If he's got it wrong, well, bad luck. And that's, that, that's a very, very important principle because that privacy of recognizing an arbitration agreement is something that's been followed the world over. Now, apart from that, the other thing that's very important to do is to ensure that Indian law is easy to understand. People will come to India and arbitrate in India if Indian law is easy to understand. Unfortunately, at this moment, it's not. And the reason why it's not is because, again, you've got conflicting decisions of various courts across the different states, and that becomes a huge problem. And lastly, you have to allow a party to have lawyers of their choice. I mean, it comes back to, a little, to, to the topic which we spoke about earlier in the morning. Um, people will come to India if they can bring their lawyers to India. I mean, I have a big advantage. I mean, I, I can practice in Singapore. I can practice in London. But I mean, how has Singapore grown as an arbitration center? Any Indian party or any party can get its own lawyer to come and do arbitrations in Singapore. That's the same thing in London. Now, you've got a judicial decision in India which lets that happen. But is that the way to go about it? The answer is no. You want to promote India as a destination? Well, then let people uh, bring in their lawyers, let people run the arbitrations like the way they want to run it. The entire advantage of arbitration is it's an agreement between two parties to resolve a dispute, and you've got to ensure that you abide by that agreement. Okay, so um, I'll open up to other members of the panel if they want to put forward their suggestions for how, uh, how it can become a more attractive destination for arbitration, but I'd also like to open it up to the audience if you have questions or if you have comments, uh, and I'll just uh, start sort of taking notes in case anyone uh, wants to. Um, if the panel would, uh, would like a, a leading question, I'd love to know who you think would make good arbitrators in India. I can take people's hands. Okay, so my question relates to institutional arbitration. So Singapore, for example, has something like SEAC, which is highly developed. They have good you know, areas where you, can, uh, you have reliable arbitrators. You have the facilities to conduct these arbitration proceedings. Do you see something like that being developed in India, like a, a domestic, not like a SEAC outpost in India, but a domestic Indian uh, institutional arbitration that comes up? Which, and how big a role would that play in making India you know, attractive as an arbitration destination? And I think it's very, very doable. On a smaller scale, some of the courts, the Delhi High Court, for instance, has set up its own arbitration center. And in many matters which have come in for appointment of arbitrators, the courts have referred matters to this institute. There is a cost control there. The fees are reasonable. The procedure is settled. And it's working, and it's working well, much better than ad hoc arbitration. So the Delhi High Court can do it, set it up on a smaller scale. I'm sure India has the capacity to come up. In fact, uh, I was suggesting to Varane that he hails from Goa. I said it's a great place to <laughs> set up the first center, the way you would draw markets, no other place. So, and he said, <laughs> take the bar and practice there. Right? And, and my second request to him is that before he decides to sue the government of India, wait <laughs> two years before I go back to private practice. <laughs> Can I just add to that and uh, say that you really don't need a domestic institution for arbitration for a particular case to be a good arbitration seat. The ICC can arbitrate can administer arbitrations across the world. It actually does so. The LCIA does it. SEAC does it as well. So you can have India as the seat. You can choose the SEAC rules or the ICC rules or the LCIA rules, and you can still have India as the seat of the arbitration. So that's one aspect. And, and there is a, a good Indian arbitration institution called LCIA India, in addition to the court annexed arbitration centers. And the idea is that you can, you, you can provide
provide LCI quality arbitration in India and Indian rates. So I think that's probably going to give us a look to domestic arbitration as well. But I, and in that sense, I also wanted to add maybe having an Indian, I mean, yes, we have LCI and we have CIAC outposts in India and they're great. But if we had like an Indian institution, and they would probably have so all the, all the, ex, the ex judges sure, who sure. are. You know, not necessarily judges. In fact, we were just discussing. You need a much broader variety Correct. of professional arbitrators, and not necessarily just retired judges coming in. You know, in fact, one area we've been ignoring is that in India, there are in arbitration jurisprudence. In recent times, there have been areas where no other country has come out with the judgments that India has, as far as multi-party arbitrations, for instance, are concerned. As far as having non-parties to an arbitration agreement. How do you enforce it against someone if there's an agency involved or you're claiming through an agent you have the floor of judgment? So it's not that the courts, apart from mitigating what went wrong, have also gone a step ahead and given judgments in areas which you don't have many international judgments. And similarly, if centers on a smaller scale can work, one of the recommendations I believe of the Law Commission is to have dedicated benches and high courts for arbitrations. Secondly, <coughs> in all these matters, as far as possible, have a time frame created, have an institutional mechanism, I think if they all come together, we can we can actually have a very successful, larger institutionalized mechanism in India for arbitration. And what you're suggesting, I'm sorry, is, is common. You know, I mean, in the United States, there's the AAA, the American Arbitration Association, which is largely picked by U.S. contracting parties to govern their rules. There's a separate wing, the ICDR, the International Center for Dispute Resolution, because they know that when international parties are involved, they don't want to pick the AAA because they're thinking, oh, all that bad stuff about U.S. litigation, like ex you know, ex excessive discovery, we don't want any of that. So you could have domestic Indian arbitration rules, and then also there's a space for its, you know, international rules like the LCIA rules, things like that. Both can exist as a, a vibrant market. Young man in the front? Uh, yeah, please. did you call me a young man? <laughs> <laughs> what a swell guy. <laughs> um, say I've been doing business with it in India for about 18 years, and I uh, have told clients in the U.S., I'm not a lawyer, that um, when you think about the Indian courts, uh, for me it's somewhat akin to the Indian nuclear arsenal. It's good to know that it's there, but God forbid you ever have to use it. <laughs> um, but my question is this. Um, most of you, I mean, you're talking about suing governments and so on. Most of the clients uh, that my consulting group now brings to India are mid-sized, smaller companies, colleges. Uh, is arbitration yet really a, an answer for a mid-sized company that may be doing business with a mid-sized company in India? Because if you're talking about this level, and these are down at this level. No, definitely for, for mid-sized com commercial companies or even, you know, uh, whatever arrangements they are. I mean, as the statistics were said, a lot of contractual arrangements between private parties will choose for arbitration. Then the larger question then is where are you going to seat the arbitration? You know, and, and if you're representing a foreign party, my proposal would be outside of India. There is one fact that you can't get away from, which is you may ultimately need recourse to Indian courts. Right? So let's say you choose your arbitration to govern your you know, arbitration as your mode of dispute settlement, you seat your arbitration outside of London, um, the arbitration award is rendered, and the Indian party, let's say it's the Indian commercial private party, doesn't want to pay up. Well, then you need a court order to go seek, you know, attach the assets. If that company is a larger company, let's say it's an Indian multinational company and has assets in different jurisdictions, yeah. then you're lucky. You can use the New York Convention, to which over 175 states have ratified, and go enforce the arbitration award in any jurisdiction where that Indian multinational company's assets are located. But if it's a smaller company along the lines of what you're describing and all the assets are in India, then you have to come to India. And then you need to recognize the award, which means going to court, and hopefully the court will not set it aside or not refuse to enforce it on public policy grounds and issue your order of attachment. That is a domestic procedure that plays out in Indian courts. So there is always that element to, to consider. You can resolve your dispute, but will you get paid then? That might re require recourse to India. I've courts. experienced that personally with a client, and my U.S. lawyer said to me, how many thou tens of thousands of dollars do you want to spend to chase how many tens of thousands of dollars? No, but I'll just give you an example. I mean, there are two advantages that arbitration will have. I mean, let's take a small dispute, which say would be, say, $200,000, which is not very large. If you choose arbitration, you've got the option of doing two things. One is you can choose the documents of the arbitration. 
which means you don't necessarily have to have lawyers who would go and present your case. There is no evidence that's recorded. It's all on the basis of documents and the arbitrator decides. Now that actually makes things much cheaper. You can never get that in a court system. The second, and most institutions also have this, you've got something called expedited arbitration. So the SIAC, which is the Singapore International Arbitration Center, allows the chairman to make a decision <coughs> in certain cases where an application for expedition is made, and that dispute has to be disposed of within six months. So they choose an arbitrator who's going to say, I am free, start to finish, six months. Now again, you don't get that in courts. Even if you're, even if I were a Singapore court or an, or, or, or an English court, I would never be able to do it as fast as that. So there are two big advantages for small companies and small disputes to actually choose arbitration. The problem is enforcement, but then I mean that's at least you have an award. So you've crossed one stage. Thank you. No, I just have a comment because I, I was, uh, I'm not a student here. I was actually a developer and a uh, hotel developer and I was developing Thai brand in India. So I faced it myself because once we were right, uh, once we wanted to actually exit out of a contract when we were, the owner and the hotel company wasn't getting along anymore, uh, we were actually threatened. Uh, I, I was in the meeting where we were threatened and none of the lawyers in India wanted to take up that case. So I realized that it was really difficult uh, to actually for a foreign company to uh, execute what they wanted to and really run their businesses. And then of course Luther and Luther came to our rescue and we <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, in and fact, for all ten cases in India, we <laughs> <laughs> normally recommend Raji <laughs> <laughs> No, no, and then who normally briefs me this call. <laughs> we are not allowed to solicit. You've got two of the best lawyers. Indian lawyers and here. then after that, I ended up losing three more accounts because the, those three owners, because then we chained our arbitration to Singapore and we were like, we did not uh, choose uh, arbitration in India because we've had, we are having bad experiences. And then none of the owners wanted to work with us. So we really, literally had to wind up our development within two years. So we signed up to hotels, but we are not signing up anymore. So it's it's actually a it's a very sad situation if you really want to develop something in a country right now. But that's my experience. No, you're right. I mean, you're it. absolutely right. I mean, I have seen this. At the end of the day, what India needs to understand and what lawyers in India need to understand is that the economy goes hand in hand with legal development. And in, in instances like this, when you, when you do things like this, and then you, a person has no legal recourse, just frustrates an investor, and he doesn't come back. I mean, the exactly. amount of the number of private equity disputes which I end up doing in Singapore is largely because of an Indian investor squeezing out the private equity investor, taking his money, not returning it back, and the the, the investor is running helter skelter. It's it's a problem. But hopefully, that should change because the minute you get an enforcement <coughs> mechanism which is effective. Uh, that will change because eventually the Indian will have to pay back. Right. Yeah, I guess my question is you had mentioned there was a lot of damage to the reputation of India as, as a possible place for arbitration. What's the current market feel? Do you think that investors would be willing to give India another chance? It seems like there are a lot of positive changes. What do you think it's going to take to convince investors to come back to India as, a, as an arbitration? I, I think I think you need expedition in, dis in, in disposal of your cases and your arbitration cases. I think that's the key because even if you've got a great judge who understands arbitration law, his problem, and like Pramod correctly pointed out, is how does he fast track one arbitration case leaving out a hundred other cases? Because as far as he's concerned, he's got to look at a hundred cases every day. So you've got to be able to expedite decisions on this, and I think if that happens, if people reach a level of finality, so they know they can finish that arbitration in one year or two years and get through the court procedure in another year. I think India will become a very, it will become a destination for arbitration. I mean that that's what happens in Singapore. I mean people ask me this question: you know, Why do you uh, should you challenge an arbitration award in Singapore? And I tell them two things. The first thing I tell them is: A, the grounds for challenging are narrow. Two, you will get a decision, and if the decision is against you, you will get it in six months. Three. If you spend, say, a million dollars running an arbitration, you'll spend another 500,000 running the, uh, the challenge. And if you lose, you lose with costs. So what, what's going to happen at the end of the day? In six months, your arbitration award gets affirmed. You lose, you lose with costs. Interest is running. Do you really go and challenge? The problem with India is you file an application to challenge an award, and you know that's going to lie in, uh, in cold storage for 10 years. You do it because that's a great opportunity for you to settle. 
So I think if you're able to bring in expedition into the court system, I think you will have a big change in the way uh, India is perceived as a destination. For and just to add to that, I think time, of course, and minimal court interference. Yes. The moment you know an award comes and it's an enforceable decree, which the act says it is, because an award is like an enforceable decree now. You don't have to make it the rule of the court any longer. So the moment you know a decree is in your hand and it'll be executed, that'll be the deterrent. The problem is the award comes and the guy knows that for its execution, I'll delay you for the next 10 years. He knows that you may have an award in your hand, but it may be a paper decree. So we come back to the same two questions, time, finality, and minimal court interference with both pre-arbitral and post-award stages. Uh, thank you very much. That's very useful. And by the way, uh, Lorraine, what you said about wine industry is very accurate, very well put. Um, I'll talk to him later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Just a thought. Uh, what I heard is that arbitration has got its ills problems, but the whole story actually ends up with the clogging of courts. Can each one of you give two two ideas how to fix this? Uh, how to unclog our courts? Two each. We'll start with needed because <laughs> then eat, they'll run out of ideas. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you one idea. Impose costs. One of the reasons why our co courts are clogged is because nobody imposes costs. You start imposing actual costs. I mean, let, let, let's, let, let's put it in perspective. I take an arbitration, I have Neeraj opposing me, I keep on taking adjournment after adjournment after adjournment. Ten adjournments later, I lose the case. Who's paying Neeraj's fee? Only his client. If I had to pay Neeraj's fee, because I was taking adjournments, it's a huge problem. Okay. I, think, I think that that's one of the So one is thing. costs. Now, I mean, I'll leave. Government itself has to reduce litigation. Government is one of the biggest litigators in the country. It has to bring down its own litigation. That's very important. It happens at all levels. And how are you going to do that? Well, Rajiv, you know better. You've got to talk to the authorities concerned. You know. <laughs> 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 who am I? <laughs> You're the man who matters. <laughs> but, but I think that there's another proposal which is actually on the table. Uh, in addition to reforms to the Arbitration Act, the Law Commission has also proposed what is called as a commercial courts uh, bill. And the idea is that uh, disputes above a particular monetary threshold would automatically go to the commercial court. And any decision of the commercial court would uh, then be appealable to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court is expected to decide that within a period of six months. And what that does, if that proposal goes through, uh, is it cuts through certain layers of court appeals. Because what would typically happen to a dispute in India today is you start at the courts of first instance, which can be then cha a decision of which can be challenged before the high court, maybe sometimes before a division went to the same high court, and then ultimately winds its way to the Supreme Court. So you probably have four layers of court decision making before you have a final one in a dispute. And if you can limit that to two, uh, and you can then have a time frame. The commercial court, the commercial division of a high court is supposed to render its decision within six months. The Supreme Court is then expected to pronounce its decision on an appeal, which may be filed against that decision in six months. What it does it, is it gives predictability, it gives certainty, because people will know that within one year you have a, a, a definite decision one way or the other in a case. And that proposal, if accepted, could go a long way in, uh, in making our court system more efficient. But I think the, the crucial thing is the courts must impose realistic costs. Because frankly, a lot of litigation is commenced in India today because there's really no characteristic policy. Because even if you lose, there's nothing much you actually lose because you're not saddled with costs. And Indian costs, as you know for sure, is, is quite prohibitive. If you go to a Supreme Court senior counsel today, the costs of a Indian Supreme Court senior counsel are probably three or four times that of one of the leading cells in England. And, and then for the court to go through multiple hearings and then award 15,000 rupees or 2,500 US dollars in costs is simply just not viable. The moment courts start awarding realistic costs, automatically a lot of this litigation will come down. And I would probably say that uh, half the kind of litigation that we see, see today would not be initiated in the first place because people know that the courts have the power to wrap them in the knuckles and impose a realistic cost order. They have that power today also, but they don't do it. No, and just to add to it, you just also need more judges. Let's be realistic, you know. There's some very good, competent judges, for instance, on the court that I come from. What does a man do with 70 cases a day? 
if he's got that 70 may include arbitration cases, other cases, there are people who will turn around and say, your case is no more important than mine. Every case requires its time. What does he do with 70 cases? So you need more judges that also, and better infrastructure. So you put a very important point, sir. Your point was that uh, we must, government must reduce their litigation. I believe the last statistics I read was 67% of all pending cases in Indian courts. Government is on one side or the other. What do you think of this concept? If you were to issue an executive order that if the government is, is the uh, one who's appealing and the matter is less than, let's say, 10 lakhs, put some numbers, uh, you can't reappeal if you lose in the first case. If it's 20 lakhs, you can go up to the High Court, 30 lakhs, Supreme Court, or one crore, whatever number. And the current cases that are there, which are pending, same formula is applied and the government withdraws them. No, no, you're absolutely you right. Right. The in, in a lot of tax matters, there have been director, directives and circulars issued in customs, excise and taxation matters that if, a, if the value involved is say less than 10 lakhs or whatever, I'm not, I, don't, I don't remember the figure, you needn't go and appeal and that's a very positive not step. You needn't go, you can't go to And you very well. Ah. So the fact is, it's not worth it. It's not worth taking it to the Supreme Court or the High Court. Put a quietus to it at some stage. The litigation, sure. Right. I'd, I'd actually add one more thing. I've been doing some study actually on the government's litigation in India. One of the most surprising things is that the government actually loses the vast majority of cases in Britain. Which is and that's not because of the additional solicitor. <laughs> 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 they've, they've suddenly started winning them in the last time. <laughs> There's a reversal there. But, uh, that, that's why they say Ache. <laughs> What's interesting about that is it suggests that there's tremendous scope to put in place measures like the ones you're suggesting that could curtail a lot of suits that actually don't lead anywhere. In fact, in, if you look at, for example, some criminal cases which represent two-thirds of the litigation in India, roughly speaking, the conviction rate is about 30%. And that's in the better cases. In some of them, it's like 15 that suggests that, that there's either poor case selection, poor evidence gathering, or something else that's leading to these you know, Something else is the three C's. The CAG, which yes. is the Computer Auditor General of India, mm -hmm. the CVC, the Vigilance Commission, yes. and the CBI, the Central Bureau of Investigation. These three C's will make sure that every officer keeps on appealing. Because he doesn't care, he says, let me lose at the Supreme Court. That's, that's the problem. That's <laughs> so if the executive order is issued, the three C's don't apply then. Yeah, I, I think I have a couple of people on this, but I'll start with Karthik and then I'll go to you. I think we are talking about government's litigation strategy. I believe there's a document which has been circulated since a decade known as the government litigation strategy. has never been enforced. I really want to know your views on it, whether it's getting enforced. And a broader question is, like, we are talking about there's so many problems. There's a problem of courts, a problem of lack of infrastructure. I think we have identified the problems. Now, what happened with Singapore was that there was an executive push to make Singapore an arbitration destination. So I want to know whether that push is there in India right now or not. Do you see that coming with the Modi government? Because they are so pro proactive when it comes to bringing in those arbitration amendments, those law commission suggestions. Do you see that happening? I think as I started, you know, when I was sitting there and I made it very clear, I don't represent the government here. I'm in my private capacity. So I really don't know what the government plans to do. But to me, all the signs are in the direction that we can do. Whether we do or not, I can't say, as Varian has been mentioning, that till now, he always gives a note of caution. Don't, you know, India should be the seat of arbitration. Avoid India. Personally, I think India has all the ingredients to emerge as a hub. But yes, a lot of corrective measures have to be taken in this. There's no doubt about it. The gentleman here mentioned is the kind of anguish he faced, the kind of uncertainties he faced, are really the concerns which India will have to address in days to come for people to come and use India as a hub. I don't think there's any running away from what the lady said, what he said. Those are exactly the concerns that we have to address. And it all comes back to the same thing. Finality, you don't interfere, pre-arbitral, give a finality to an award, and that's it. That's all that you require. And you have the talent, you have the expertise, and you have Goa. <laughs> I wanted to ask about the other C, which is perhaps the elephant in the room here, is, is corruption, right? I mean, what does the group feel? I mean, do you agree that the corruption is a big issue in the in the legal system in India today? And what, is, what are the suggestions to solve that? Because to me, that's what shakes the, the individual's confidence in the system to say, will I get justice ultimately? Look, 
I think that's a problem not just in the legal system. That's been a problem which the country has been facing. So it could be cutting across many areas. Now, similarly with the profession, it would be naive to say that there are no problems as far as corruption is concerned. Having said that, I still within the system see many good people doing their work and because of whom a certain faith remains in the system. You know, it's very easy to bash, condemn and say all's wrong. Of course, there are things which are wrong, which have gone wrong, which are going wrong, which need to be corrected. But within those contours, things also function. There are people doing their work. So to answer your question, of course, there are problems which need to be corrected. But there are many distinguished lawyers and judges, I feel, who are doing their work very honestly. But yes, to say that there's no corruption, there's no problem, would really be just... So how to correct? How to correct when corrections required? What are your thoughts? In-house mechanisms, deterrence, as far as if judges are concerned, they're coming up with an accountability bill, which is coming out as far as lawyers are concerned, better regulation, better enforcement, better deterrence. If you're found, you can't delay a corruption case indefinitely. It must come to a finality. The rigorous punishment should be imposed after that. All that must follow in a time frame. Why does corruption over a period go on? Because you know you'll never be caught. You know there'll never be a sentence. As he pointed out, convictions don't take why do why do convictions don't take place? Convictions don't play don't take place because the judge is bad. Convictions don't take place because you have poor evidence collection. You don't have the material. Very often it's the judiciary which is blamed. But what does a judge do? He can't convict a person if you don't have the evidence there. At the end of the day, to convict, you need the evidence. So better policing, better evidence collection, better deterrence. Yes, and I'm sure things will work. You're also seeing other states now beginning to um, try to address this issue. So the US you know, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, the UK Anti-Bribery Act, at least multinationals operating in India are much more aware of this because there is now extraterritorial enforcement by the DOJ here. And you're seeing trainings done by GCs based in, let's say, New York, of their Indian operating entity. So that might also, because they're not worried about the Indian courts catching them or not catching them or being complicit or other private parties, they are worried about a very vigilant DOJ that is being quite aggressive in the last couple of years, which can help. With the, uh, sorry, we're out of time, but um, I will uh, like to uh, thank the panelists. I hope you all join me for a very lively.